What's up guys, this is Miss Peer Editor. Today I'm going to edit a paragraph from a literary analysis essay step by step to show you some techniques you can use to turn your paper into an A+. Now this paragraph is already pretty decent, but I'm going to show you how to make it even better. If you'd like, you can take a minute to just pause this video, read the paragraph over before we get started. Okay, so I've assumed that you've now paused this video, so let's get started. Let's look at the first two sentences of this paragraph. Lastly, the lover of the lady or the tiger would fit into a romantic setting as his actions, along with those of John Proctor's from the play The Crucible, written by Arthur Miller, portray elements from the romantic movement. So first off, we see that there are some formatting errors in this sentence. Since The Crucible is actually a play, the title of the play should be italicized rather than in quotations. So we could change that. Also, we are starting off this paragraph with the word lastly because this, word, this paragraph is the last body paragraph of an essay, presumably. However, I feel like this topic sentence is pretty weak, and starting off with the word lastly is a really obvious transition word, and the sentence structure is already awkward as it is, so I think in our revision we're going to take out the word lastly because it's just unnecessary. And let's look at the second sentence right after this. The main romantic element that the lover and Proctor's actions convey include the ideas that the individual is all important as opposed to society. So this is a pretty unclear sentence as well, and I believe that we can combine the first two sentences to make one really strong topic sentence. What both of these sentences are trying to say is that the crucible and the lady or the tiger are both demonstrating elements from the literary romantic movement. So let's replace those sentences with this. Through their own actions, the lover and the lady or the tiger and John Proctor in the crucible demonstrate romantic ideals by challenging societal standards to pursue their individual interests. Now this is a much better topic sentence because not only are we introducing the idea of romanticism, but we're also explaining how romanticism is conveyed through both works by highlighting the individual's importance as opposed to that of society. Let's look at the next two sentences. The lover's strong feelings for the princess convey their unconditional love. He believes that it is possible for both to love one another, even though they are on different ends of the social hierarchy. Furthermore, the lover's feelings for the princess are stronger than his loyalty to society and society's expectations of him. So first off, there's a grammatical error. There should be an apostrophe before the S in the word lovers. Also, the semicolon in the first sentence isn't really used that well, and it leads to a pretty awkward sentence structure. So we're going to remedy that. Also, this, the wording of the phrase different ends of the social hierarchy is a bit confusing. So I feel like the writer is trying to throw in some uh, vocabulary in here by using the word hierarchy, but we can really make this even more clear for the reader. So let's look at a replacement for these sentences. We're gonna combine the, these two sentences again. So here's our replacement. Although the lover and the princess are from different social classes, the lover allows his loyalty to the princess supersede his loyalty to the kingdom's customs. We've really summarized those two sentences succinctly we haven't used any super fancy words unless you want to count the word supersede, um, but any other word would be fine as well. Here's the next sentence. He willingly risks his life to love the princess, even though if the king discovers them, they love her will suffer dire consequences. So apart from the obvious error in the phrase they love her, which should be the lover, this sentence isn't really actually you know, that bad, 
on the outside, but I know we can definitely tighten it up to make it more concise and even more clear for the reader. So first off, we're going to replace the word he with the lover, so we know exactly who we're referring to. And the next word, willingly, is an adverb because it ends with ly. So it's definitely a great practice to cut out all of your adverbs in your writing altogether because adverbs, really, they really tell instead of show in your writing and usually they're pretty unnecessary. So for in this example, we can assume that if the lover is risking his life, he's doing it willingly, so we don't even need to say the word willingly. So let's take that out. Next, instead of saying love the princess, so the lover risks his life to love the princess, that's kind of repetitive, so instead we're going to say to be with the princess, which means the same exact thing. And then the next phrase is, even though if the king discovers them, they, the lover will suffer dire consequences. So this is a pretty awkward phrase, and let's see if we can clean it up a bit. Let's say instead, since he will suffer dire consequences if the king discovers their relationship. So this is definitely more clear for the reader. Instead of saying that the king discovers them, who we don't really know, we don't really know who them is, we're saying that if the king discovers their relationship, which makes it a lot clearer that the king clearly disapproves of the princess being with the lover. So here is our replacement for this sentence. The lover risks his life to be with the princess since he will suffer dire consequences if the king discovers their relationship. Next is John Proctor from The Crucible, on the other hand, defies his society and authority by refusing to attend church, pl plowing on Sundays, arguing with the Reverend Paris, not having one of his children baptized, and commit committing adultery. So this is just a really long sentence, kind of run on. Let's cut it down. First off, we can take out the phrase, on the other hand, and we can do this by simply say, starting off the sentence with the phrase, in the crucible. Because we're, by doing this, we're showing that we're shifting to another piece of literature, and this phrase acts as a transition in and of itself, so we really don't need the phrase on the other hand. Next, we're seeing that John Proctor is defying his society and authority. Well, let's define who that is to make this even more clear for the reader. Instead, we're going to say he defies his religion and government, because that's really the central important part of this story is that John Proctor is defying the Puritan religion and the really oppressive government in Salem in which the story takes place. And next, saying refusing to attend church, let's just cut that down to say by missing church. We've pretty much just cut down three words to one. That's really a simple edit. Uh, plowing on Sundays, that's good. And let's see here, arguing with the Reverend Paris. I don't feel like this is really that relevant to the content of the sentence, so let's just take it out. It's not necessary. And let's see what's the next phrase, not having one of his children baptized. So I don't like starting out a phrase or a clause with the word not and then putting a verb right after that, especially one that ends with ing. It just doesn't really lead to a very clear structure. It ends up being pretty awkward. So let's say this instead. He's refusing to baptize one of his children. And so that's a much clearer edit. And then the next phrase is, and committing adultery, all of which can be considered sins. So committing the committing adultery part is fine, but the phrase that says all of which can be considered sins, I don't really, I'm not really sure that's necessary because I think the reader can determine that these are considered misdeeds um, according to the government and uh, John Proctor's religion. Let's just take that phrase out. I think it's kind of unnecessary flab in the sentence. When both characters are deemed criminals, we really don't like this wording because it is using the passive voice in the phrase are deemed. 
something is being done to the characters as opposed to the characters doing something themselves. So we should never use passive voice uh, in our writing. Instead, we're going to change this to active voice, and we're going to say when both characters face criminal charges, they face arbitrary trials. So we're going to replace this second use of the word face with undergo, which is a simple synonym. So we're going to say they undergo arbitrary trials in which both outcomes have negative implications. Colon, the lover will either lose the battle with the malicious tiger and suffer a prolonged gory death or attempt to love a lady other than the princess, whereas Proctor, who is accused of siding with the devil, can choose to confess but have his named, name marred or die with dignity, refusing to submit to absurd accusations of practicing witchcraft. So I've already stumbled several times reading the sentence. That's a pretty bad sign. That shows that the sentence is really long, unnecessary, and just not clear at all. The colon is technically used correctly, but I think for the sake of clarity, we're going to take it out. So what we're going to do is we're going to change that colon to a period, and we're going to take all of the content, all of the parts of the sentence that come after the colon, and turn and cut that into two sentences to address both stories. So first off, we're going to take the sentence and replace it with the lover has the option to marry a woman other than the princess or suffer a gruesome death in the tiger's pit. This is a really simple sentence structure, gets the job done. We're not using any kind of awkward uh, transition words such as the word whereas. And it's really allowing the reader to understand that, okay, first we're going to tackle one story, then we're going to tackle the next text, which is the crucible. So our next sentence is going to say, similarly, Proctor must falsely confess to conspiring with the devil or die in front of his neighbors if he denies the accusations of practicing witchcraft. So we've used this word similarly to transition to the next story. It's okay to use a word that, you, that ends with ly if you're doing a transition. I wouldn't suggest doing it that often, but in this case it works. And after the sentence, we're going to say, if he chooses the former, he will sully his name forever, but if he chooses the latter, he can die with dignity. So this is just pretty much preserving the content of the original sentence, making sure that we're not altering the meaning in any way. And these replacements for that sentence are a lot clearer than the original. There you have it. We have our new version of this paragraph. I've cut out roughly 68 words from the original draft. And you can use any of the techniques I've shown you to edit your paragraphs for length and clarity. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and tap the bell to receive notifications whenever I make a new video. Two of my other videos can be found here. Comment down below and tell me what other writing topics you'd like me to cover. I will see you next time.